Well, hello to my two favorite Lindas, Linda B and Linda B. Uh, we're here to share some, some really interesting topics today. And I'm uh, hoping that the subjects that we're bringing up will be topics that you can really resonate with and are helpful to you. So I'm going to start off today, and my book is Healing the Shame That Binds You. And this is a book that I've had for many years. It was written by John Bradshaw. He sold more than 1.3 million copies of this book. And he is really considered uh, one of the this is one of the 100 most influential writers on emotional health in the 20th century. I actually had the honor of attending one of his workshops many years ago. And it, 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 it was amazing because he had all of us together and he got us to where we were going into our, the child within us that was hurt. And man, you never seen so many tears, but it's all towards the healing process. So the chapter that I picked is um, the family system. So it starts off, it says, I like this quote by Joel Kovitz. She learned to her dismay that she only felt loved when she wasn't being herself. Then the other one by Joel Kovitz, children will invest as much energy as is needed to ensure the preservation of family harmony, even if it means sacrificing themselves to do so by developing psychological disorders. Wow, that is so true. So it starts off the family system. It says, toxic shame is primarily fostered in significant relationships. If you do not value someone, it's hard to imagine being shamed by what he says or does. I don't value you. I don't care what you think about me. But the possibility of toxic shame begins with our source relationships. If our primary care caregivers are shame-based, they will act shame and pass that toxic shame onto us. There is no way to teach self-value if one does not value oneself. Toxic shame is multi-generational. It is passed from one generation to the next. Shame-based people find other shame-based people and they get married because they have that in common. It says, when a child is born to these shame-based parents, the deck is stacked from the beginning. The job of parents is to model. Modeling includes, includes how to be a man or a woman, how to relate intimately to another person, how to acknowledge and express feelings, how to fight fairly, how to have physical, emotional, and intellectual boundaries, how to communicate, how to cope, and survive life's unending problems, how to be self-disciplined, how to love one another and love oneself. Shame-based parents cannot do any of these. They simply don't know how. Children need their parents' time and attention. Giving one's time is part of the work of love. It means, means being there for your child, attending the child's needs rather than the parents' needs. For example, this is Don Bradshaw. I used to spend lots of time with my son. Often it consisted of my watching a football game while my son played in the room. If he made too much noise, I scolded him. We went, we spent time together, but it was quantitative rather than qualitative. Part of the work of love is listening. Children are so clear about what they need and they will tell us in no uncertain terms. We need to listen to them. This requires a fair amount of emotional maturity. To listen well, one must have one's own needs met. If one is needy, it's really hard to listen and hear, hear a child that has a need. Our neediness is like a toothache. When we are shame-based, we can only focus on our own toothache. Needy, shame-based parents cannot possibly take care of their children's needs. The child is shamed whenever he or she is needy because the child's needs clash with the parent's needs. The child grows up and becomes an adult, but underneath the mask of adult behavior, there is a child who is neglected. Needy children are insatiable. 
They have a hole in their soul created by unresolved grief and developmental de dependent def deficits. This makes them adult children. They can never get enough as adults. Healthy adults are satisfied with what they get and work harder to get more the next time. An adult child can't get enough because it's really a child's needs that are still in question. I wanna finish it up because I think this is just so powerful. It's, it's, he says, for example, in my beginning relationships, I always went too far and wanted too much. If I met a girl, we hit it off. I immediately began talking to her in terms of marriage, even after one date. <laughs> Once she was in love with me, I expected her to take care of me like a mother. Needy children need parents. So adult children turn lovers into parents, someone to take care of their needs. The bottom line is that shame-based needy marriages that receive no treatment create shame-based needy families. The children grow up in the soil of shame rather than in the nurturing arms of love. Shame-based families operate according to the laws of social systems. Children go to church, go to school or synagogue and grow up to live in society. Each of these social systems adds its own unique combination to the toxic shame induction process. Now, I know that was a lot, but I, 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 I really, I can identify with it with my own self and in particularly with the women that I'm working with that are incarcerated. A couple of stories that I've heard from them recently were textbook from um, what they were sacrificing everything to buy back the love of their family that they never got. So anyway, heavy duty subject, but I'm interested to hear how my two favorite Linda's respond. Well, it, it, I have a question. Um, what if a child is an orphan and they're not exposed to parents? Do, do they still have some type of shame as a result? Well, Nowadays, there really isn't such a thing as a child that's just orphaned with no parents. If a child is, if he's born and he can't be with his family, he's immediately up for adoption. Um, so he either goes to adoptive family, uh, which normally they are really, really wanting a child. So those can be some of the most loving families. Um, but even if he's in a home with a, a, a mother yeah. that's not taking good care of him and not giving him that love, um, if he is removed from that and put into another family at, by a certain age, usually by about age three. But prior, after that, um, a lot of that ability um, to love and receive love has been lost in those first three years when their needs weren't met. Okay. And there, there's also two types of shame, right? They say in the English language, uh, we don't have enough definition of the word shame, whereas other countries, uh, they do have multiple definitions of shame. Like for instance, uh, shame uh, can be discretionary. You know, you, you can make a decision. Uh, what's the word? Discretion. Discretion before the action is one type of shame and disgrace after the action is another type of shame. Yes. So, yeah, the, the toxic is more of a disgrace type, right? Right. It's a toxic, okay. where you're just shaming the, the child. You're no good. You can't do that. And not being loving, not spending, like it said, spending time with your child. Even if you're just sitting in the same room while the child's building a puzzle, you, that connectedness is, is what they're referring to. Thank you, Kathy. Sure. How about you, Linda? Be, be you. <laughs> be you. Be you. Um, be you. I, I love John Bradshaw. When I was a counselor, we used that book to teach not only family systems, but how families that start so loving, right? Oh, you're going to have a baby. You're so excited can go so incredibly wrong because of the way that that they were raised and they were taught. I was of a generation 
that was definitely spare the rod, spoil the child. And if the child did anything wrong, that was a horrible reflection on the parents. So you weren't just being a kid, you were representing the family. And my mom, you know, I'd come home crying, something bad happened and, and wanting comfort. And she'd say, did you ruin your dress or did you mess up your shoes? What will people think? And it's like, I, I forgot to consider that, you know, when I fell off my bicycle or whatever it was. But it was very much her believing if she could make it look like she was a good parent, then she was a good parent. And that was her her best skill, the best thing she was doing. And I think that's what they mean by toxic parents and toxic relationships. A lot of time, if the father had a dream of being a great athlete and blew his knee out in junior high, he may really be pushing his kid to be a great athlete, not because that's what's best for the kid, but it's dad's next best chance for fame. You know, oh yeah, I'm the father of... And then anything the kid does that doesn't live up to the dream dad had for him, he feels like he's a failure. He's got shame. He has fallen the fallen the wayside in the family. Um, powerful book, powerful topic. And when they talk about intergenerational shame, they don't mean like it's inherited, you know, like, oh yeah, this runs in the family. What they mean is, I'll talk about something else Mr. Bradshaw speaks of as a trauma bond. If I grow up in a family and the only attention I can get is negative attention, I'm going to, and I'm looking for love, right? I'm going to associate that negative attention with love. Let me give you an example, because that sounds crazy, right? If growing up, the only time anybody talked to me, they were screaming at me and and somebody said something wacky like, you know, I wouldn't say this if I didn't love you so much, you know, or, or something like that. Then in my little brain, that screaming is how much they love me. Oh, they wouldn't say this to me if they didn't love me, right? Mm. So I go out and search for love and I find somebody who doesn't say things like that to me, I never feel like they really love me. If they loved me, wouldn't they scream at me? And that's what they're talking about as far as the intergenerational. I was raised this way and I can seek out exactly what I was raised with. And now I met my screamy husband who obviously loves me and we raise our child and we love our child. So we scream a lot. And that's how it passes through generations. It, you start, you know, looking for love. It's a, it's a natural human need. It's a need of a child and you're the parent. So whatever you give them, they're going to find love in that, you know, Oh, you love me enough to spank me and correct me. Well, when I start looking for love outside of the family, I may look for those same things. Breaking that cycle is a powerful, powerful tool. And, and luckily, we've got the education and the resources and the changing culture that's made breaking some of those toxic binds a lot easier. So... I talked a lot too. <laughs> and I, I told you, I used to teach this stuff. So you're right in my wheelhouse. Um, anybody want to say anything else before I close this out? Okay. Well, we hope you have enjoyed this, this conversation. And if you have questions, we hope you look into the book or do a little research because breaking those generational trends can make the world better for generations to come. Thank you for being with us. Before we leave, I would love it if you would do me the honor of joining me in prayer. Let's just sit back and close our eyes if that's comfortable and take a breath together. God, 
We are so grateful for the opportunity to talk about topics that are as important and urgent as the one we covered today. God, we know that as we learn the truth, we are able to look beyond some of the pain, some of the hurt, some of the misguided notions that we have carried through our lives. God, in you, we find love, all love, pure love, the love that guides and heals us. And we are so thankful. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you will tune in next time for something completely different. God bless. Thank you for joining us, and let's stay connected and grow in spirit. We are on Facebook, search for Unity Church of El Cajon, and follow us and like our posts. You can reach us on YouTube at Unity Church of El Cajon. Please subscribe to our channel, watch our videos, and leave comments, which can help us improve. We are on the web at unityofelcajon.org. Email or call our church office to receive our weekly newsletters, which lists all of our activities and opportunities to learn and grow together.